Well, good morning. Uh, welcome to our service today. Um, just a couple of things uh, to announce. The calendars uh, are printed and they're on the way for us all to be able to pre-order. So you can uh, get in touch with Rona Grigg uh, to pre-order them. You may have received an email this week about the calendars. They're all uh, a fundraiser for the new church project uh, in Tain. Also, we had our AGM on Wednesday evening, which was a great night, really encouraging to hear uh, some of the different ways that the Lord has been encouraging us as a congregation and using us as a church as well. Um, feel free to ask about some of the stories that we heard on Wednesday night too. Uh, but the, the accounts are available at the door if you want to see them, uh, so feel free to pick a copy of the accounts up for 2020. We're going to sing together Psalm 100 in the Scottish Psalter. Psalm 100 is on page 362. We're continuing to study the tabernacle today. And you read in verse 4, O enter his gates with praise, approach with joy his courts unto. Praise Lord and bless his name always, for it is seemly so to do. Psalm 100 will stand and sing to God's praise. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can uh, come before you and that this morning we can worship you, uh, sing to you and read your Bible. And Lord, we pray that you would speak to each one of us. Uh, we may not have come expecting to be spoken to by God, but that is uh, the amazing thing about gathering for worship. And as we've been singing there about coming into the courts, we think of the tabernacle that we're going to be studying these mornings over the next few weeks as your people in Israel would come into the courts and they would seek to have their sin forgiven, all the wrong things that they have done, and how gracious and merciful you were to, to forgive them in that amazing and structured way of the tabernacle and then the temple 
But Lord, how amazing is your grace that we don't have to go to a specific place, but we come to a specific person in and through your son, Jesus Christ, who is our sacrifice and who has paid the price for all of the wrong we've done, all of the sin we have committed, and he's willing to take all of it from us and take it upon himself. And so that's our prayer for everybody here today, that they would know their sin forgiven and their life given over to Jesus Christ. Be with the young ones who are here. We thank you for them. We know some of our own children are away or are unable to be with us. Thank you for uh, the visiting children that are here. We pray for them. We pray for their own church that they're a part of, for their for the congregation there and for the ministries that are that are over them as the gospel is preached into their hearts week by week. And so we know they'll be missing their children uh, today too. So go before us and help us as we speak to them and speak to each of us today. May you speak clearly and powerfully to us all. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to ask uh, some of the young ones, what is your favorite color? So you can tell me what your, what your favorite uh, color is. Anybody want to share their favorite color? Black. Black is your favorite color. Anybody else got a favorite color? Jack? Blue. Well, that's good because that is my favorite color. For Oh, good. Me and Aiden are the same. So we have the same favorite color, probably for the same reason as well, but we won't go into that uh, just now. You guys can see these posters on the wall. This is called the Tabernacle, and you can see there's a big fence all around the Tabernacle, and today I'm going to talk to you about the gate to get into this place. So there's only one way in, and it's through the gate, and it's right there at the front. It's hard maybe to see from where you are, but it's Lots of colors, just three colors there. Blue and purple and red, or another name for red is scarlet. So I'm going to talk to you about one color today, the color blue. Because in here, in the tabernacle, that's where God was. So the people wanted to go in there and to be with God. So the color blue, when you look up into the sky on a, a warm summer's day or on a cold Winter's morning, we look up into the sky and we see that the sky is what color? The sky is blue. So the sky is pure blue. And sometimes all that we can see is the blue sky. And that color blue, you can see it in the picture there, it's to remind us of heaven. So when we look up to the sky and see that it's blue, it's to remind us of heaven. And God is in heaven heaven. So when we think of blue, we think of God being in heaven. But we know that we live in Scotland, and when you came out of your house today and you look up into the sky, if you noticed, you probably didn't see much blue sky because there were so many clouds, clouds that are filling up, waiting to pour rain on us or soon pour snow down onto the ground. There's clouds that are in the way of us seeing the blue sky. I remember going onto a plane one day, and it was a really uh, cloudy, miserable day. And we got onto the plane, I thought, this isn't going to be a very nice flight. And we got on the plane, and we flew up. The pilot took us towards the clouds, and then he took us through the clouds. And then once we got past the clouds, do you know what we saw? Just pure blue sky and the sun shining. So even though all the clouds were there, the blue sky was right behind the clouds. And you know, even though we couldn't see the blue sky for the clouds, the blue sky was still there. And sometimes, even if we get really uh, sad or if we're really happy or even we just might be really busy, we can forget, our, forget about God. We can stop seeing God. We can stop looking to God because sometimes good things get in the way. Sometimes sad things get in the way. But the amazing thing is that God is always there. 
And he's always wanting you to bring all the sad things, the busy things, the happy things. He wants you to bring them all to him. Because just like the blue sky is always behind the clouds, God is always there behind whatever is going on in our lives. So let's pray together. We're going to pray um, the Lord's Prayer uh, together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Well, the young ones can uh, go through to Sunday school or crash. We're going to read uh, from Exodus chapter 27 as we continue studying the tabernacle. Last week, Alistair gave us an introduction to the tabernacle, and today uh, we're going to think about the perimeter fence and the gate in particular. This is the courtyard. So Exodus 27, and we're going to read from verse 9 to 19. Let's hear the word of God. This is the instructions that uh, the Lord was giving to Moses. He said, make a courtyard for the tabernacle. The south side shall be a hundred cubits long and is to have curtains of finely twisted linen with 20 posts and 20 bronze bases and with silver hooks and bands on the posts. The north side shall also be a hundred cubits long and is to have curtains with 20 posts and 20 bronze bases with silver hooks and bands on the posts. The west side on the courtyard shall be 50 cubits wide and have curtains with 10 posts and 10 bases. On the east end towards the sunrise, the courtyard shall also be 50 cubits wide. Curtains 15 cubits long are to be on one side of the entrance with three posts and three bases. And the curtains 15 cubits long are to be on the other side with three posts and three bases. For the entrance to the courtyard, provide a curtain 20 cubits long of blue, purple, and scarlet yarn and finely twisted linen. The work of an embroider, embroiderer with four posts and four bases. All the posts around the courtyard are to have silver bands and hooks and bronze bases. The courtyard shall be a hundred cubits long and fifty cubits wide, with curtains of finely twisted linen five cubits high and with bronze bases. All the other articles used in the service of the tabernacle, whatever their function, including all the tent pegs for it and those for the courtyard, are to be of bronze. Amen. This is the word of God. Well, let's uh, join together in prayer uh, once again. Heavenly Father, we do thank you that uh, we can uh, draw near to you today and we can bring our different requests and petitions before you, whatever's going on in our lives, whatever is clouding us from seeing you, perhaps. Uh, we may have many different obstacles that we are facing. And we know many of our people are away from us this, evening, this morning due to ill health or precaution. And we know that the virus is still uh, spreading amongst our people and throughout our communities. And so, Lord, we pray that you would be with them. Uh, we pray for those who are in hospital today uh, with this virus and that you would help the doctors and the nurses and all the NHS staff as they uh, seek to continue to bring things under control to the best of their ability. Uh, 
We know even our hospital here in Rigmore is uh, at a lot of capacity uh, to what it's been even over the last couple of years. And Lord, we just pray for the staff there going week after week and day after day. And those who are working out in the communities as well, going into people's homes, Lord, we thank you for the work of the NHS that has been uh, perhaps highlighted, uh, and yet we can so easily going back to uh, forgetting about what they are doing, uh, but they're not forgetting it. They're seeing how lives are being affected and how lives are even being taken day after day. And so, gracious God, we thank you uh, for those who have the gifts and the talents of uh, our emergency services to be there in times of great needs and difficulty. And we just pray, Lord, that you would continue to support them and sustain them and that our NHS throughout our nation would be provided for with all the needs that uh, they require. We pray that you would uh, be with each of us here today. You know the prayers that are on our lips and in our hearts. And perhaps we're not used to praying uh, very often. And so, Lord, we ask that today we would pray for the greatest need that each of us have to have our sin forgiven. And so we ask, Lord, that you would put that desire in our hearts to, like these Israelites would come to the tabernacle with a sacrifice to have their sin forgiven, that we would come to Jesus as our sacrifice, simply asking, simply praying that you would take away our sin. Lord, we ask that we want to pray for other churches throughout our denomination. And so we pray uh, for the congregation of Grey Friars in Inverness. We think of Malcolm McLean there, and we thank you for his many years of ministry, for all that he has uh, done in proclaiming the gospel, how they as a congregation have reached out into that area of the city. Thank you for uh, Malcolm and his wife and their families. Lord, we pray that you would be with him. We know what he's contributing to uh, in, in writing different books and commentaries of the Bible. And Lord, we just ask that you would use all of these for your glory. And we pray for them as a congregation, uh, specifically with their youth work, that you would aid them in that. And as they hope to reach into the community with many needs that are around them, uh, that the young people would hear the good news of Jesus Christ. So, Lord, we ask as we come before you today, we think uh, of this tabernacle and we think of how the people would see that white wall. And even as we read there, it may have been a lot of uh, different numbers and measurements. and may not see how this is going to relate at all, but even the instructions that you gave to Moses for the three sides, and there was no entry and no entry and no entry, but just on one side they could get in. One way to God one way to have their sin forgiven. And so we come today in the same way, that there is only one way to God, only one way to have our sin forgiven, and it's through the gate, he who calls himself the gate, Jesus Christ. And so our prayer is that each of us would enter through and give thanks to God. Forgive us for our many sins. We ask it in your precious name. Amen. We're going to sing again in Psalm 65 before we study this passage. Psalm 65, it's on page 82 in the Sing Psalms. I'm going to sing from the beginning down to verse 5. Again in verse 4, it says, How blessed are those you choose and bring within your courts of grace. We're filled with blessings in your house, in your most holy place. Psalm 65, from the beginning to verse 5, if we're able, we'll stand and sing to God's praise.
I'll turn back to <clears throat> Exodus chapter 27. The thing about the courtyard uh, in this tabernacle. If you keep your Bibles open and keep an eye on the pictures of the tabernacle, you can see the perimeter fence on these posters. There is perhaps a small leaflet for you to see on your pews as well. But when we uh, reach the age that we could be more helpful than we would be a hindrance, we were drafted in to assist with the setup of uh, the Highland Games, which took place in our village year after year. I know it's a lot of hard work as we uh, carried over the poles, held the ropes up for the marquees, as we nailed the pegs firmly into the ground. And we would get it all set up, but knowing at the same time that in just a matter of hours, we're going to have to take all of this back down. Well, we've begun this uh, new sermon series on the tabernacle, God's mobile home. And the Israelites, they were traveling through the desert to get to the promised land. But every time they stopped, all the materials would need to be reassembled. Uh, the furniture would need to be carried carefully. The courtyard's bronze pillars were propped up. And these great curtain-like walls that were, that, and the gates that surrounded the tabernacle, they would all need to be unfurled and put out. And this great curtain around the tabernacle, you can't see it in your poster there, but it was white. It was pure white. But then every time they would set out again to journey on for another few miles, all the materials would need to be taken down, packed up, and then they would march on. So you can see its shape. It's 150 feet long. It was 75 feet wide. It was around the size of four uh, tennis courts. And so as we approach the courtyard, as you come towards the gate here on the east side, we're going to focus on the linen curtains that are all around and the entrance gate. So we're going to think about the distinction and then think about the invitation. So the distinction and the invitation. Well, first of all, uh, the distinction. If you go to London and you walk past St. James's Park down towards Buckingham Palace, then when you get there, you're going to notice that there's a fence. You'll get pretty close, but you're not going to get in because there's a fence there. A nice fence, but that fence surrounds the building and all of the grounds of Buckingham Palace. And the fence has been erected there for, I guess, different reasons. It's there for security. It's there to ensure access is granted only to those who are allowed to come in. And here the perimeter around the tabernacle has been erected for those reasons too. It's there to prevent anyone unlawful from just casually entering into the presence of God. It was a line of separation between sinful man and holy God. You may, may remember uh, when Moses was up the mountain receiving the Ten Commandments. The last time we studied Exodus in chapter 19, he was receiving the Ten Commandments. And the Lord set a perimeter around the mountain too. And he set that perimeter so that the Israelites couldn't come too close. They couldn't even touch the mountain because if they did, they would be struck down and they would be killed because they are unholy and he is holy God. And so there must always be this distinction between the holy and the unholy. And even today, that distinction has to be made between the church and and the world. As the Lord's people, we are the church. We are those who have been called out of darkness into his marvelous light. We are in union with Christ. And because of that, we are to live our lives distinct, different to how the world lives their lives. We are to be in the world. We are to be friends 
to an extent with the world, but we're not to be of the world. The gospel creates a line of separation. Traditionally, uh, when we would celebrate communion, when we would take the bread and the wine, remembering what Jesus has done for us on the cross, very often we would lay out a white cloth. Just like the curtain around the tabernacle, we would lay out a white cloth on the pews somewhere up towards the middle. And then there would be a white cloth down at the front on the table. We would lay out that white cloth for a distinction between those who would come to sit at the Lord's table and to those who would not. Those who would come beyond it and those who would sit behind it. And I can remember uh, going to communion like many of you can. And especially in Lewis, when we would be, there would be two services going on at the same time. One in English and one in Gaelic. And we would be in the English service in the church hall because there was a, few, a bit less of us. And then at some point in the service we would all get up and we would walk round outside in the front door and walk into the Gaelic service who were waiting for us, who were perhaps singing at this point. And there the elder would be. He would be halfway down the church. And he would be beside that white linen cloth summoning us to come down. And so those of us who were Christians, we would walk towards him and we would walk past that white linen cloth and we would take our seat at the Lord's table. But if a friend was with us or if somebody's wife or husband or children were with them who were not professing Christians, then they would walk so far but no further. And it was often a very a poignant moment. There would be a separation between a husband and a wife, between parents and children, between friends, because some have taken Jesus to be their sacrifice, and so they take their place at the Lord's table. And the others have not yet put their trust in Jesus Christ alone, and so they sat behind the white cloth. You know, every time we celebrate communion, we are all making a profession. Those who come to the table, they're professing that Jesus is their Lord. That he is the sacrifice for their sins. And those who sit behind the table, whether that be physically in the church, or who choose not to come when the communion is taking place in their community, those who are behind the white cloth are professing that Jesus is not their savior. That they have not, and perhaps will not, believe in Jesus as their sacrifice. And so when the Israelites uh, would set up camp, you can see it there in your poster or on your wee leaflet, you can see some of the tents that are around. There would have been hundreds of thousands of Israelite tents. You can go to Numbers 2 and read how many of the tribes of Israel and where exactly they were situated. Because if you went up onto a nearby hill, perhaps a hill like that, and you looked down, it would be an awesome sight because what you would see is these black, hundreds of thousands of black tents all around in a circle, and right in the middle was this pure white curtain surrounding the tabernacle, surrounding where God was. It was a beautiful image of God in the midst of his sinful people. We know that Jesus was pure and spotless. And yet he came to dwell among us. He came to, which is the same word, tabernacle, amongst a crooked and a perverse generation. Why did he do that? To save us from our sin. To make us as white as he is. To make us as white as snow. And so this white fine uh, linen of the courtyard fence. It separated those who are outside from those who would come inside. And especially separating the people from holy God. And it's the same as sin 
separates us from God. If we have not been cleansed by the righteous sacrifice of Christ our Savior. So there's a distinction. There's white linen curtain cloth around the tabernacle which is representing God. There's a distinction between the holy God and the unholy people. So how do an unholy people get in contact with a holy God? Or we come secondly to the invitation. Because there is a way, there was a way for Israel and there's a way for you too. The invitation. So within the tabernacle, there is the holy of holies. That's in that tent right in the middle. The holy of holies. It's an inaccessible place except for one day a year, the high priest was allowed to go into the Holy of Holies. But the holy place, which was just beyond it, only the Levitical priests were allowed to go in there. They could go in daily, but they could only go in, they were the only ones who were allowed access. But then there was this white linen fence, as we've been talking about, seven and a half feet high, surrounding the entire tabernacle complex. And how wonderful it must have been for the Israelites who would have walked around the outside of that screen to come then finally to the east side, right here at the front, and to find that there was a gate, to find that there was access for them at this gate, that they could pass through that gate and enter into the courtyard. We may often come across a gate and find that it's locked or find that there's a sign that says no access. But not this gate, not the gate of the tabernacle. It may be closed like that, but it wasn't locked because even a child could put out their hand and push their way through to enter. It wasn't hard to come in. It was actually very simple. And so it is with becoming a Christian. So it is with salvation. Reach out your hand in faith and come in. It's very simple. But accessing uh, the tabernacle, it's a repeated theme that we find in our Bibles throughout the Old Testament. We've been singing about it already. We're going to carry on singing about it. We sang in Psalm 100, enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. We're going to sing in Psalm 84 in a moment, which says, And my soul longs, yes, even faints for the courts of the Lord, for a day in your courts is better than a thousand elsewhere. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of sin. Because of the perfect sacrifice of Jesus and his finished work on our behalf, we can come. We don't only come into the court, but now we can come right into the holy presence of God. You know, as children, we would uh, try and sneak into some of the marquees and the tents at the Highland Games. Uh, we could slip in at the sides or crawl underneath, but that wasn't possible here at the tabernacle. Because if you walked around the perimeter, on three sides, you would have found this white wall of no access, saying to you, not this way, not this way, not this way. There was only one way in, and it was on the east side. As Alistair said last week, going east meant going away from God. So Adam and Eve, all the way back in Genesis they exited the Garden of Eden through the gate on the east when they sinned. Their son Cain was, uh, went east to the land of Nod after he murdered his brother Abel. Lot went east to Sodom and Gomorrah when he separated from Abraham. They had all gone east to go away from God. But now the invitation is to come west, to come back to God. But there was only one point of access. There's just one gate, not many. And there's just one way to God, not many ways to God. And Jesus declares himself to be that way. 
in John 14. But even more specifically, he says in John 10, I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. And that was the promise of the tabernacle. If you wanted fellowship with God, if you wanted your sin to be forgiven, then you had to come through that one and only way. You had to come God's way through the gate. And it is the same today. If you want fellowship with God, you must come God's way. You must come through the gate, through Jesus Christ. But you know, it's interesting to note that since there is just one gate, it's interesting that everything and everyone had to come through that single gate. So when the animals would be taken to be slain as a sacrifice for the people's sins, they came through that gate. And when the common worshipper would come to have their sin forgiven, they had to walk through the same gate. And when the high priest on that morning would come to finally, that one day a year, be able to enter into the Holy of Holies, he would still come through. The same gate that the commoners came through and that even the animals came through. He would walk through that single gate to make atonement for the people's sins. It doesn't matter if you're uh, rich or poor, if you're young or old, if you're well known throughout the world or hardly known throughout this village. This is the way you enter through Jesus Christ. The gate to the courtyard was 30 foot wide wide enough to receive whosoever would come. And isn't that the amazing promise of what we were hearing last Sunday night in John 3, 16? Whosoever believes in Jesus shall not perish, but have eternal life. Whoever you are and wherever you've been, today the gate is open for you to come in. But this gate, as we were saying earlier, it's a very attractive gate. And the gate here, the, at the opening, and then also the door into the tabernacle, and then also the curtain that you can't see there, and the veil, the curtain that's inside, entrance into the Holy of Holies, and also the ephod that the high priest would be holding, they all had these three colors on them. As you can see, well, not so clearly in this picture, but blue, purple, and scarlet. Blue, purple, and red. And we're going to delve into the significance of these colors more and more as the weeks go on. But the color blue, as we were saying to the children, is a heavenly color. And a king in the ancient world would often wear blue because he was considered by his people to be divine. But here at the tabernacle, God is reminding his people that he is divine, that he is the king of kings and the Lord of lords. When we look up to the sky, we see that it's blue. and Sometimes, or most of the time, the clouds will come in the way and block our view. But they never pollute it. Because events or people or circumstances they may cloud your view of God, and even today that may be happening. But God is always there. But then let me come secondly to the red, to the scarlet. The Bible does blue, purple, and scarlet, but let me come for a reason, secondly, to talk about red. Because scarlet relates to humanity because of the earth. And the first human was Adam. And he was given that name not only because it means man, but the root of his name means red earth. Red earth. And so the scarlet cover that is woven into the gate, it was to remind every single person, every worshipper, that God, the God of heaven, has come down to earth. That God has become man. So the blue pictures his divinity, the divinity of Jesus as the Son of God, and the scarlet pictures the humanity of Jesus as the Son of Man. And then thirdly, we talk about purple. And just like the others, purple is a royal color. 
And the Bible presents us in the middle, blue, purple, and scarlet. Not only because if you take blue and scarlet and blend them together, you get purple, as you know. But when we bring together the Son of God and the Son of Man, what do you have? You have a mediator. Someone who stands in the middle. As Paul says in 1 Timothy 2, there is one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. If you were here a few weeks ago, we thought about Jesus in the praetorium room. Just before he went to the cross, they took him into the soldiers, took him into this room, and they beat him, and they spat upon him, and they mocked him, and they dressed him up. You remember they dressed him up as if he were a king. And they put a purple robe on him. But little did they know that before them was the king of kings. And the lord of lords. Well as Israel uh, journeyed on towards the promised land. They had to dismantle and reassemble the tabernacle. And its courtyard over and over and over again. But you know this enclosure that we're looking at on the poster, it's been taken down once and for all. When Jesus offered himself as a sacrifice on the cross, there was no more need for any other sacrifices to be brought into the courtyard because the way has been opened up for all to come to God and for all to receive forgiveness. The way is opened up for all to come, but there remains just one way for you to come. And that way remains open to you today. Through Jesus Christ, who is the gate, it's been graciously left open for your whole life. For many years, that gate to Jesus, to have your sin forgiven, is open. But soon, The gate will be locked and no more will enter in. The one and only way to God through Jesus Christ. He is the one who said, I am the gate. Whoever enters through me shall be saved. Today the gate is open, but soon it shall be locked forevermore. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that the way is open, that you have provided a way for your people who, unholy, we know ourselves to be sinners, and yet you are so gracious that you made a way for us to come to you and through your own Son, Jesus Christ. And so we thank you that we don't have to have a a tabernacle in this way anymore, but simply to pray, to speak, to you, our God, and ask Jesus to save us from our sins, to come into our hearts. And so that's our prayer. And while the door, while the way is open, that we would come in and that nobody would delay. We pray for the work and the power of the Holy Spirit to carry all of these words. To the hearts of your people. Amen. We're going to finish by singing in that psalm we mentioned, Psalm 84, in the Scottish Psalter, and from verse 7. From verse 7 to verse 12. Again, verse 10 speaks to what we were mentioning here about entering the courts of God. For in thy courts one day excels a thousand. Rather in my God's house will I keep a door than dwell in tents of sin. So Psalm 84 from verse 7 to the end will stand and sing to God's praise.
Now may grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit rest and abide with each one of you, both now and forevermore. Amen.